Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, committee. If I can turn your attention to a presentation over here on the, uh, the, the slideshow over here. My name is Bradley Pierce, and I'm grateful to be here. Thank you for the invitation. I'm a Christian. I'm a husband, father, an attorney, and of course, I'm a loyal Republican. I'm here on behalf, I'm here from Williamson County, SD5. I'm an abolitionist. I'm here on behalf of Abolish Abortion Texas. I'm here to, today to talk about a legislative priority that's already a legislative priority that was adopted by the Platform Committee in 2016. Our legislative priority that we're pushing is our name, Abolish Abortion Texas. As you know, this is already a legislative priority. You have the, the wording there in front of you, the handout that we've given you. It got the most top votes in the committee when it was considered. It was adopted by, by nearly 90% of delegates in 2016. It led to HB 948 being filed in our legislature with 12 co-authors. It got the support of over 68% of Republican primary voters three months ago as a proposition on our Republican primary ballot. Of course, when we think about this legislative priority, as my brother John C. goes mentioned to us, the sticking point on this legislative priority is the word ignore. It's the word ignore, because we're talking about, as it says, ignore court rulings which would deprive an unborn child of the right to life. And when we think about those court rulings, we think about Roe versus Wade. And so that's what this legislative priority um, calls on our legislature to do, to ignore Roe. So why ignore Roe? Why two years ago did we say ignore Roe as a party, and why are we calling for that again? Because there's two ways to approach Roe versus Wade. As, as you see there, there's two ways to approach Roe versus Wade. Change the court or ignore the court. Well, here's what 45 years of trying to change the court has looked like, just a little bit of history here. So in 1973, this was the makeup of the court. There were six Republican appointees, three Democrat appointees, and that's who heard and decided Roe versus Wade. It was a supermajority of Republican appointees, and yet they ruled seven to two in favor of Roe and struck down Texas and other states purported to strike down their laws against abortion. Five of the six who voted in favor of Roe versus Wade were Republican appointees, which means that even if there had been zero Democrat appointees, we still would have gotten Roe versus Wade, which is very sad. Uh, in fact, one Democrat appointee even voted against Roe versus Wade, the same number as Republicans. Well, fast forward for the next 19 years in our country, we had four presidents that had the opportunity to appoint pro-life justices who would overturn Roe versus Wade, and they told us they would do that. The three Republicans did. The Democrat, Jimmy Carter, actually did not have the opportunity to appoint anybody to the court. So for the next 19 years after Roe versus Wade, we had 100% Republican appointees to the court who we had been told by those presidents would be pro-life and would overturn Roe versus Wade. We had gotten rid of six people who had voted for Roe versus Wade and replaced them with six of our own. So in 1992, we thought the stage was set because of what we had been promised, that Roe versus Wade would be overturned. But that's not what happened. In 1992, four out of six of those justices appointed by Republicans after Roe voted to uphold Roe versus Wade. Now, I'm no mathematician, but at that rate, even if we have Republican presidents from now on, they will never overturn Roe versus Wade. And you may say, well, that was, that was Gerald Ford and that was H.W. Bush. Well, President Reagan didn't do that. Well, I'm not saying it was his fault, but even two of his, two of the three that he appointed, ended up voting in favor of Roe versus Wade as well. So even if we had President Ronald Reagan's from now into infinity, Roe would not be overturned at this rate. Today, only one current justice has ever opposed upholding Roe, and that's Justice Thomas. We have three justices that we have marked here, as you see in the bottom left, as unknown. We have just Chief Justice Roberts, Justice Alito, and Justice Gorsuch, the newest appointee. And we say unknown because we're being gracious. But when it comes to Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Alito, actually, it's not as unknown as we wish it were. Because but in 2006, or I'm sorry, 2007 and 2016, both of them had an opportunity to oppose Roe when Justice Thomas wrote opinions opposing Roe. Justice Scalia signed on to the first of those. He had passed away before the second. And Justice Thomas asked Chief Justice Roberts and Alito to sign on to those opinions opposing Roe, and both of them refused. 
Justice Gorsuch is a new appointee. We don't know for sure where he's going to be, but he has never publicly indicated that he would vote to overturn Roe. So we're continuing what history has, has our, we're continuing our history here. So for the last 45 years, when it comes to this strategy of changing the Supreme Court, it's been 45 years of failure. And I know that may sound like a harsh word, but have we overturned Roe? Have we overturned Roe? No. And so some people say, well, we've got some successes along the way. 55,000 plus babies are murdered in Texas every single year. I don't call that success. That is not success in my book. So the, the, of the two options for responding to Roe, changing the court or ignoring it, changing it has not worked. We need to ignore the court. And we're not talking about ignoring the court itself. It's a constitutional institution. We're talking about ignoring an unconstitutional opinion of that court. So some people say, well, Roe, Roe is the law of the land. No, it's not. It's not the law of the land. What is the law of the land? The Constitution tells us. It says, this Constitution and the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof, shall be the supreme law of the land. Roe was not made pursuant to the Constitution. Roe was unconstitutional, so it's not the law of the land. The Supreme the Constitution of the laws of the land. No one I know, even on the pro-abortion side, would say that the Constitution expressly creates a right to an abortion, right? We, I agree with that even with my pro-abortion friends, um, which I don't have too many of those. But, um, but they would say, well, it's not expressly in there, but it's implied. Oh, and I, where is that implied? Oh, well, that's in the right to privacy. The right to privacy? Where is that in there? Oh, well, that's also implied. Well, where's, where is that implied? Well, it's in the penumbra of the Constitution, they say. And if you're like me, you say, what? What is the penumbra of the Constitution? Well, that's where the Supreme Court said this right to privacy, where the right to, so-called right to an abortion is found, is in the penumbra of the Constitution. Not to get too technical or scientific, but here's what a penumbra is right here. If you've got a light shining on something, then the shadow, the direct shadow of it is the umbra, and then the outer kind of fuzzy, hazy shadow, that's the penumbra. So the Supreme Court itself said that this right to privacy and right to abortion is not in the Constitution. It's not even in the direct shadow of it. It's in this hazy kind of thing. If you kind of look at the Constitution just right, you kind of feel like you see a right to privacy and a right to abortion there. So it's not in there. It's not in there. Some people say, well, you have to read between the lines. Someone said that to Thomas Jefferson one time, and he said, I've read between the lines. All I found is blank. If it doesn't say it, it ain't in there. So it's unconstitutional. There's no right to an abortion in there. And if saying it's in the penumbra is ridiculous. We need to follow the Constitution. Nowhere in the Constitution does it create a right to an abortion, either expressed or implied. And if you agree, if the delegates agree that the Constitution does not protect a so-called right to an abortion, then this concept of ignoring Roe is easy. The concept is easy. I know the application is hard, but the concept is easy. And that is this. Where the court has ignored the Constitution, we must ignore the court. Where the court has ignored the Constitution, we must ignore the court. And some may say, Bradley, that's lawlessness. That's lawlessness. No. Lawlessness is what we live in right now. Lawlessness is 55,000 babies a year being murdered. That's lawlessness. Lawlessness is what is advocated by those who would concede to the Supreme Court the unlimited power to amend and ignore our Constitution, which is our supreme law of the land. The Supreme Court is not the supreme being. God is. And they're under him, and they're also under our Constitution, and we are allowing them to trample it. I'm not advocating lawlessness. I'm advocating a return to the rule of law. Lex Rex, the law is king, not the court's. And the court is subject to, not master of, that law. But Bradley, if we disregard the court on this issue, where will it end? This isn't a close call case. We've already said that the Constitution does not express or imply a right to an abortion. No one is saying that the Supreme Court is, has no authority on anything. We are simply saying that the Supreme Court is bound by the Constitution. And when they go outside the Constitution, they go outside their authority. And when they do so, we are free and, in fact, duty bound to disregard it, lest we give legitimacy to tyranny. 
Not only can we resist it, we must resist it. Finally, some ask, where will it end if we ignore Roe? I ask them, where will it end if we do not? I'll tell you where it's already ended, 61 million plus dead and counting every day. If we don't ignore Roe, there's no end in sight to the Nile River of blood which continues to flow through our land. Another reason is to reinforce legislative This is a legislative priority in our platform right now, and we need to defend legislative priorities in closing here. If we put on a legislative priority, and then our legislature substantially ignores that, and then we rip that legislative priority off, we've just sent a signal. And that is, dear Republican legislators, you may ignore the grassroots will of your party. And our response to that is that we'll give up. We'll give up. We're sending him a signal that we're giving up. Some people say this is not very specific. Specific? It says outlaw abortion. How more specific does it need to be? We're not here to write legislation as a, as a party. We are here to make it known to our legislature what is most important to conservative Texans. That's why we're here. But the legislators are complaining. They don't like this. Good. That means we're having an effect. When you start putting pressure on a legislature, legislature or legislator and they start complaining on it, good. You've got their attention. And that's what we're here to do as a party, to get their attention. We're not here to pass things that they're already going to do anyway. We're here to tell them what conservative Texans want. So that's what we're here to do. So, and this has not gotten less important. 110,000 estimated have died since this became a legislative priority. This has gotten more important every single day. So when it comes time, I would be asking the committee and I'm asking our delegates to readopt this as a legislative priority for the sake of the entire legislative priority system so we don't undermine our own legislative, all legislative priorities, but also, most importantly, for the sake of the estimated 55,000 who are going to be killed this year and the next year and the next year until we finally follow the Constitution and ignore Roe.